Welcome to the Just Word Podcast. I'm Pat Bolland. The Just Word Podcast is brought to you by Just Wealth, investing the way it should be just for you. Larry, welcome to the podcast. Uh, a real pleasure to talk to you, but you tell a great story, or at least I read a great story, about how you wrote this book and why you wrote this book. Care to share that with us? Yeah, it's great to be here, Pat. Thanks. Uh, sure. Uh, well, <clears throat> I was sitting uh, on, uh, on one of the bank towers downtown, um, uh, still working in my, my, my main career in the banking business, uh, a few years ago, and I got a call from my sister from New Brunswick, and um, she said to me, hey, Larry, uh, all we hear about is how well the stock market's doing, but this this bank mutual fund that we've had for the last 15 years really hasn't done very much, and we just don't understand why. Can you have a look? So I, I Googled the fund, and uh, I asked my sister, hey, do you realize you're paying 2.3% in fees, and she said, "What well, we're paying fees?" And I said, "Yeah, yeah, two point three percent a year. Uh, that's whether your fund goes up or down. You, you pay those fees." And she she said, "Oh, you mean two point three percent of our of our returns?" And I said, "No, no, two point three percent of of your total amount invested. You pay that every year for fifteen years. <clears throat> that means you've you've lost thirty five or forty percent of your money to fees." And um, my sister was, she was shocked. She didn't even realize she was paying fees. Many Canadian investors are in the same boat. They don't even realize they're paying. Uh, very few can figure out how, actually how much they're paying. Anyway, so, you know, she was quite upset. Like most Canadians, uh, every penny of her retirement savings is, is, you know, is really important to her. And, um, and that, that, didn't make me feel very good as a, as a participant in the banking slash investment industry. This is, this is my industry. And, and I just, I just don't think that average Canadians are, are well served by the investment industry. And it, it's got me kind of fired up and, uh, um, and that uh, sort of led me to write the book. Okay. So you write the book. You, you used to work in the banking industry. I would say, obviously you're retired now uh, from that. How did your colleagues react? Well, uh, most of my colleagues uh, uh, were very positive about it. Uh, you know, I, I, I spent my career in the industry, but I never dealt with individual investors. I was always on the capital market side, dealing with large institutions and, uh, and, and companies and governments, et cetera. So I, never, I was never on this side of the business. Uh, so my colleagues uh, generally are saying, yeah, go Larry, that's great. Um, did I, have I received some flack? Yeah, but that's, that's okay. Um, but most people, you know, most, my colleagues from the industry are, you know, they, they, they're professionals, they know how it works and they, they generally, I think, you know, agree with, with what I'm, uh, I'm trying to do. You know, you think of the Canadian banking system as one that serves and protects Canadians. Yeah. That, that, that you're going against that. Well, no, not really, because I, I think the banks in many ways serve Canadians very well. Like you said, uh, you know, for instance, going through the financial crisis, banks uh, in other parts of the world were failing, collapsing. Uh, Canadian banks held up really well. Uh, so there are many things that Canadian banks do well. I'm, I, I'm a fan of banks. I like banks. I just mm. think in this particular area of, of, of selling investment products to average Canadians, they take advantage of, of Canadians' faith in, in the banking system uh, and, uh, and their lack of knowledge and lack of understanding and lack of transparency about the costs uh, that, that the banks charge which by the way, consume about 50% on average, about 50% of total investor returns over time, which is a catastrophic result. Um, you know, so I, I, yeah, I criticize the banks in this area, but you know, banks overall, I think you know, they, they, they do lots of good things as well. But you're suggesting though, and when you talk about transparency, that they're uh, hiding it. Or, or do you think the banks are doing this on purpose? I, I mean, they have a business model after all, they're, they're, that's their job. Well, look, uh, 
the industry never presents a proper bill. They'll never, they never really show what, <laughs> you have to really dig hard to find out what, what you're paying uh, in, in annual fees. And, and then on top of that, Pat, you've got the, the compounding effect of those costs over time. You know, somebody might think, well, I'm paying a 2% annual fee. Uh, that doesn't sound that doesn't sound like very much, but you know, just take a simple math example. If you're paying a two percent fee every year for twenty five years, what does that add up to? Yeah, fifty percent, right? People don't tend to do that math, and I'm oversimplifying it a bit, but that's that's the impact over time. And they you, sh- you they sure don't mention that when they're marketing their high cost funds, uh, which Somebody- by the way generally underperform. Um, massively underperform uh, the simple index funds. Yeah, uh, and I will get to that in a second because I do want to talk about the mutual fund industry as part of the banking industry. But yeah. uh, should somebody like government step up, do you think, Larry, and, and say, and because I know it happens in other countries, there needs to be more transparency. It needs to be simplified. And that has been happening over the last few years, but I don't think it's done enough. What are your thoughts? Uh, the regulators have uh, forced some increased transparency, but uh, the the industry ha- keeps fighting and fighting and fighting against it. Uh, you know, another example is um, the regulators, Canadian regulators, try to impose a best interest standard. They try to apo- uh, impose a, a legal standard on the industry to act in the best interest of uh, of investors. Well, the industry fought that as well, and and uh, why you know, why would they fight up, that? That seems to be logical, a, a fiduciary logical. responsibility. <laughs> it's, of course, it's logical, but it would destroy their high fee business model because they wouldn't be able to sell, <clears throat> you know, uh, punitive high fee products anymore. Now, uh, so what what do the regulators do? They water it down. Now that they they're moving forward slowly and slowly, but really hasn't. Um, it really hasn't improved the transparency for the average investor. Now, what there, there have been improvements out there for the average investor, great improvements. They've come from new product developments, like low-cost index ETFs, like robo-advisors, et cetera. Uh, and and um, if you figure out the basics, uh, the same banks that want to charge you uh, super high fees will provide a great level of service for very, very low cost, great service for very low cost. If you figure out how to do it. Yeah. To get around to uh, another area that I, I don't understand why it hasn't done or grown more is performance fees. So if you're a bank or, or a mutual fund or anybody else and does very well, you charge more. And if you don't do very well, you don't charge as much. It's, again, it seems to make sense. Why isn't the industry doing it? Well, because one, one reason is the industry generally doesn't outperform uh, wow. the, the, the indexes. So, you know, so it, it would not work for their business model. It, you know, unfortunately, the way the industry is set up, they're, they're addicted to these high fees. Um, they've got huge numbers of advisors across the country. Uh, they've got, uh, you know, got, they've got sales teams, marketing teams. Uh, compliance there it's it's a very expensive model to run um, uh, so they're addicted to these high fees they would they wouldn't be able to survive on performance fees they wouldn't they, the, the industry would collapse yeah but as I say other countries ha- have uh, advisors out there they have uh, mutual or similar to mutual fund companies and and they're doing fine I, I just uh, think yeah that I mean there's some of that out there but but not a lot uh, and, you know, some of them uh, have performance fees. There are some funds that have performance fees on top of uh, base fees. That uh, so, you know, I, I guess there, there are some out there, Pat, but it's it's not prevalent among retail, uh, the, the retail investment world around the globe. You've made the point twice now that mutual funds uh, tend to underperform the indices that they're supposed to be beating. Uh, why? Is there an easy answer, or is it quite complicated? No, there's a very easy answer. Uh, the, uh, the managers of those funds uh, just are not able 
consistently to overcome the impact of those high fees. So, you know, let me, let me give you an example. If I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, a 2% uh, annual fee on a mutual fund over 25 years consumes about 50% of the total return of that fund. Yeah. So, uh, so if you take that one step further, that means that a fund manager managing that, that, that mutual fund would have to generate double the total return over 25 years of the index to match it on an after fee basis. Can't, you know, that's just not, that's just mathematically not going to happen. Now, you know, there's thousands of funds out there. Will, will a small number of funds potentially achieve that? Yeah. But the problem is you can't predict which ones. So, you know, 90, and all the stats show this, uh, Pat, um, 80, 90, 95, 99% of funds, depending on the time frame, underperform the simple stock index, largely because of the fees they charge. And, wow. and you know, they, they, they say they charge high fees because they're going to outperform. It doesn't happen. I mean, that's just part of the, uh, you know, the, the marketing of the industry, which is, um, and which, which is not, they're not being straight with, with uh, investors. Okay, but you've come up with a way to combat that, if you will, you know, a concept that you call T-Rex. Um, I assume it's named after the dinosaur. <laughs> yeah. Walk me through what well, uh, you mean by T-Rex. T-Rex, well, yeah, it's, uh, it's an acronym that stands uh, for uh, um, Total Return Efficiency Index. So, uh, you know, I had to come up with a little acronym for it. It's just a little tool. It's on my website, larrybates.ca. Yeah. Yeah. And it just shows uh, the impact of, of fees over time. And anybody can go on there and do their little calculation. If you know what you're paying in fees, if you know you're, what you're being charged, and most people uh, don't, but if you can find that out, you can use that little calculator to, uh, to look and see what the impact of those fees that you're paying will be on your investment experience over time. Uh, but, you know, in the book, um, I really, it's, it's based on th three basic principles. First, take a little bit of time to learn investment basics. You know, the industry say, will say, look, Pat, hey, this investment stuff, it's, it's way too complicated and dangerous. Just, just trust me. That, you know, take a bit of time to learn the basics. You don't have to be an expert. Uh, investing can be very simple. Um, and the more that you know, the better off you're going to be. Even if you stay with your high cost mutual funds, getting a bit of, a bit of knowledge is, is power. It gives you, <clears throat> it makes you a better informed consumer. You know, Warren Buffett said, the best investment you can make is in yourself. So number one principle, invest a bit of time in yourself and learn some investment basics. It'll serve you well over time. Second point is be a long-term investor. Don't focus on the market day to day. That's just a bunch of noise. You know, being a, being a long-term investor, you know, owning, owning businesses through the stock market in the long term, that's what makes billionaires rich. It's, it's what makes pension funds, gives pension funds the return to pay their, uh, their members, et cetera. Uh, Richard Thaler, the, the Nobel Prize winner, once said, uh, 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 Riff Van Winkle would make a great investor. He'd invest before his nap, and 20 years later, when he woke up, he'd be happy. <laughs> and you know that's long-term investing, and and that's what really the benefit of the stock market is. And then the third principle of the book is minimize your costs. Costs are where Canadians get killed in their investment returns. And uh, make sure uh, you know investments. All investment services cost money. But, you know, understand them and only pay for what you need. And if you follow those three principles, you can make a big, big difference at the end of the day. And uh, um, a, a bigger retirement uh, fund uh, means, uh, means lots more smiles. Yeah, no kidding. Okay, so we start with educate yourself. Uh, we go in to take a long-term approach and then we talk about low cost. But uh, suppose I'm brand new uh, in the saving field. Where do I find low cost? What do you recommend these days? Yeah, there are uh, three 
uh, three or four different ways. First way is first ga gain that, get some investment knowledge. Um, and you know, the, the first method would be actually do it yourself. Uh, choose your own stocks and bonds. Open up a, uh, a discount brokerage account at one of the banks or one of the other uh, providers and, and, and pick your own stocks. Now, I would suggest, Pat, that that's probably appropriate for maybe five or 10% of investors out there who have some knowledge and experience. Larry, you, you realize you're now recommending people go to those discount brokers that are owned by the banks. Well, that's fine. Uh, the banks provide a great service to their discount brokers. Look, okay. the banks, the, the big Canadian banks, they're smart. Okay, they they want to charge the highest fees they can. But if investors figure it out and go and want to and go through a low to a lower fee service, they'll provide that too. So you, in order to beat the bank, you don't necessarily have to leave the bank. Now, look, there's some great other providers too. You should check them out. Right. But uh, the banks will provide that service if that's what you want. Um, a, a second method, I call it assemble it yourself, you know, using low cost index ETFs um, to where you don't have to ever choose a stock or bond, but you can have a, a very effective portfolio that serves you well over decades using just two or three uh, or four index ETFs. Fantastic, fantastic products. Um, and a third way would be to, uh, to use a robo advisor. If you're not quite ready to you know, choose your own ETFs or you don't want to do it, your, do it yourself, you can choose an, an online advisor, some nicknamed robo-advisors, that uh, can be a, a, a fantastic alternative for those that are, are a little hesitant and don't want to do it themselves. And that's totally understandable. It's not, it's not right not for everybody to do it themselves. But robo-advisors, they charge more than you know, index ETFs but way, way less than, than, uh, than mutual funds. Uh, and so you, you, and you benefit most, that savings stays in your pocket or stays in your account and gets to compound over time. So those are three methods. Um, and there are some other, uh, there's some other low cost methods as well. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting. You talk about ETFs and we, you and I use that term interchangeable and yeah. people know what it is, you know, an ETF. A lot of people don't realize that an ETF is just a different kind of mutual fund that's really just low cost mutual fund. But what, what you're saying about uh, exchange traded funds being the terminology for an ETF, but what you're saying is the robo advisors provide a level of professional asset management, right? They do. And, um, you know, one of the criticisms of, of robo advisors is they're, sort of cookie cutter portfolio, they provide cookie cutter portfolios. Mm -hmm. You know, most Canadians, uh, you know, everybody's different. Right? Everybody has different circumstances, but most Canadians, their circumstances are not exceptional. They, so, you know, uh, a robo advisor that offers, you know, a dozen or, 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 or some offer, or offer more, um, different portfolio mixes, that's probably just fine for 95% of Canadians. Um, the, 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 get a bit of advice from a robo-advisor, answer a bunch of questions. They'll recommend a portfolio that, that is designed to suit your, your time frame, your, your comfort level, your willingness to accept risk or, or, or not. And, and uh, you know, for most, for most investors, certainly most people that currently go to their bank branch or their insurance advisor or whatever and buy these expensive mutual funds massively better. You know, um, full disclosure, and, and I'm into transparency, Just Wealth sponsors this podcast and they've got 60 or 70 portfolios. So you've got a lot of flexibility within the products that they offer, as an example, as opposed to a bucket of five or six different kinds of funds, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, uh, you know, I, 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 having that array of, of different options is, is great. Uh, I, I think, you know, for most people, uh, they, they probably don't need to go to the 60th option, you know, because uh, as I said, most, for most Canadians, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward uh, in terms of choosing an asset mix. It's basically down to, look, do you want... You're willing to take 
a level of risk where you have 80% stocks in your portfolio and 20% bonds or, or is it 60-40 you know, or, or, or 20, whatever the ratio is? That's probably the most important question. But anyway, the, the robo-advisors generally um, are, are worth checking or should def definitely be checked out by, uh, by, um, by Canadians, whether you've got you know, a few thousand dollars or even a few million dollars. Um, if, if you're currently uh, paying own, own mutual funds, you're likely to be much better off going going uh, going that route or one of the other routes I mentioned. Okay, again, back to somebody just getting started with money. Uh, you talk about robo advisors asking you questions about where you want to put your uh, money and and what your portfolio should look like. But what are the questions as an investor I should ask? Well, I think. Uh, What's the purpose uh, of of your investment? What's what is it for? Is it for uh, coming up with a down payment for for a home that you that you hope to 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 act on in a couple of years? Um, is it for retirement? Is it for uh, some some other purpose? Uh, that's and what's the time frame? You know, retirement. If you're if you're thirty years old and you're thinking it's retirement that you're saving for, well. You know, if you put put the money in most of the money, for example, in the stock market, well, it's not going to matter what what happens to the market day to day. Uh, market tanks uh, next week or next year. Uh, what happened? What's more important? What's ha is what happens over decades. So maybe, and and stocks over decades tend to outperform everything else. Um, mm. So you might be more aggressive there. But if you're uh, saving for a, a down payment that you plan to act on in a couple of years, well. You know, a two-year time frame in the stock market, there's a lot more risk. So maybe you want to be much more conservative. So those are some of the questions like that, Pat. Uh, and, um, you know, I talk about, a lot, talk about that a lot in the book. I was just going to say, people should pick up a copy of Beat the Bank, the Canadian Guide to Simply Successful Investing. Uh, so, Larry, it was a great read and a great chat. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Larry Bates, author of Beat the Bank, the Canadian Guide to Simply Successful Investing.